to have a clear conscience. Do you like having a clear conscience? Amen. Is it a good feeling? Yes. How does it feel when you don't have a clear conscience? The life turns to mud, doesn't it? it, it nothing, the things that normally bring you joy don't bring you any joy. Even England beating Wales wouldn't bring you joy unless if you didn't have a clear conscience. Um, a clear conscience is a valuable thing. It's something that I dare say everybody wants. And it is something you can't buy. You can't have a sort of genetic predisposition to a clear conscience. You could be completely deluded, I suppose. But there's no way to just manufacture one. You, you can't go, there's no factory, there's no shelf in Tesco for purchasing a clear conscience. It just doesn't, it's not there, right? Mm. But everybody wants one. Everybody wants a clear conscience, but how do we get it? And we're going to find out something about that in this passage we're going to look at today. But before we get into the, uh, no, let's read the passage and then I want to ask us to do something. So let's have a first a look at the, first, the beginning here of chapter 9 of Hebrews. In verse 1, it says, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This is called the, most, called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered covered Ark of the Covenant. Its Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover, but we cannot discuss these things in detail. Now, when everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry, but only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functional. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the new order. We'll stop there for a minute. We're going to go to look at the rest of this uh, shortly. But the old way couldn't clear the conscience. Outer regulations, outer washings, outer performances, outer ceremonies couldn't change the inside. Something else is needed to change the inside. Now, here's the question I have before I go on and talk about the rest of this, which is this. I'm going to ask us to talk to each other about this for, for a couple of minutes, all right? And then we'll come back to the text and what I've got to share. The question is this. In your own self, what are the signs that you have a guilty conscience? Not what do you think about other people, but in yourself, when, when do you know that your conscience is not clear? You, you sense, you know that it is not healthy, you're not feeling clean or cleansed in your own conscience. What are the signs and symptoms in your thinking, in the way you live, perhaps in your feelings? Because if we don't know when we have a guilty conscience, we're not going to know how to apply what God teaches us to how to deal with that, right? So I want to ask us just for a minute to reflect on that and talk about that with someone sitting next to you if you feel okay to do that. And if you feel a bit like it's too vulnerable, uh, too intimate or something, then that's fine. You don't, no one has to do this. But let's take a couple of minutes if we'd like to. And then I'd like to hear a few of us share who'd be willing to do that. So can we take two minutes to do that? Okay. Talk about yourselves for two minutes. We've had a couple of minutes. <laughs> Let's see what we have surfaced, if we're willing, feel able to share it. So, who be brave, who be brave, and be willing to share their own, one of their own symptoms of when you feel like, mm, I know my conscience is not in a good place. Yes. Uh, 
I'll be more kind of hiding, don't want to expose myself, don't want to be in contact with anyone, just want to you know, uh, kind of avoid basically. Avoiding people? Avoiding people, yeah. Shut, hiding away? Hiding away. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, Jerome. When I feel doubtful. When? When I feel doubtful. When I feel doubtful. When you feel doubtful. You got that? You mean about your faith? Or just... No, in my deep, like when I, when I try to do something and if I'm not sure about it. Okay. I'm not having a clear conscience. That sort of hesita hesitation and doubt. Okay, thank you, Lizelle. Um, <coughs> unsettled and not at peace. Yeah, that sort of just not quite being able to settle down and... Peace is absent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why? Yeah, what about not something wrong? You know it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that helps, yes. Rudy, did you yeah, turn it up? Yeah, the I'm talking about um, is, uh, I think, like, I can, I can uh, feel irritated. Like, I have a lack of patience. Like, I'm less tolerant. So I think I'm less tolerant with myself. I feel right. in deep with myself, upset with myself. So that makes me, I think it comes down to not being at peace. And so things get to me easier. Mm. Uh, I think what Jerome talks about, your confidence, your confidence takes a knock. Okay. Confidence, yeah. yeah. Confidence, confidence isn't there. Mm. Yeah, anybody else? We'll move on. Oh, okay, all right. Hopefully we, yeah, Rico, you want to yeah, add one? I think we, we say with Johnson is, is, um, is, is I, I tend to shy away from the discussions I know I should have. <laughs> okay, the conversations that you know will be helpful, yeah. but staying away from them because we might be exposed, yeah. Yeah. right? <laughs> the reality of what's really going on could come out if we talk with people. People become scary when you know they are the, the, possibly the agents of God to reveal what's going on <laughs> in our hearts. I know, and it's, it's not always a bad conscience that might do this to us. It could also be other things, but... It's important to at least know some of your own symptoms of when your conscience is troubled mm -hmm. so that you will then know how to deal with it. And I think just to be clear as we go through this passage, we haven't got time to deal with all the issues of conscience in one sermon. There's a lot in the Bible, Romans 14 and other passages that will deal with that. But I think there's a primary level of, of, of having a clear conscience and then a secondary not exactly level, I can't think of the, quite the right word, but the primary level is the clear conscience that God gives us before God in what Jesus has done, and that's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to talk less about the secondary area of conscience where we have a, a conscience issue with something, uh, but we're going to have to deal with that in another sermon, because that's not really what Hebrews chapter 9 is about. Other passages in the Bible deal with that aspect of conscience issues. We're dealing today with being given a clear, clear conscience by what Jesus has done. Now, when we don't have a clear conscience, it's very frustrating if we don't know how to get one. Anything you want but can't get but you need is very frustrating, right? Like <coughs> when you're in a cafe and you can't log on to the Wi-Fi. I mean, that is just the worst thing in the world. I was in a cafe recently not long ago and, um, and I was connected to the internet in this, I forget which cafe it was, and a lady came over with her iPad and say, can you connect to the Wi-Fi? As if I was some IT expert. I mean, Ian, that would have been helpful to have Ian there, but I, I don't know. And so she handed me her iPad and said, you know, can you... Do? I was tapping away and I couldn't make it work. And I did. It then occurred to me, she could go and ask the owners of the cafe. Uh, it might have been a better idea. But, you know, she was frustrated. I was frustrated. I couldn't help her. When we don't get access to the things that we really need, we get very frustrated. This year is the 100th anniversary of women not only campaigning, but in this country, gaining the right to vote. 1918. An awful lot had happened in the years running up to 1918. And can you imagine the time? I mean, 100 years ago isn't all that long ago in some ways. You think about our, our brother in the church, Sid, who's 92. It's not much older than him. And my mother and father have a friend who's 103 who was alive when this happened. Wow. And so it's not that long ago, but can you imagine a world in which women can't vote? Not only that, they can't own property. Uh, they don't automatically inherit their, their, their husband's in, uh, estate. Uh, they couldn't have a bank account. Um, when, the, when child benefit first came in, it was paid to the husband, uh, not, not to the 
the wife didn't have access to it except through her husband. And, and we could go on about all those things. So um, it, we don't live in perfect times now, but we live in at least slightly more enlightened times, and for which we should be grateful because in many parts of the world, um, the access to freedoms that we have now are not available. But that's a, another story for another day. But the, the women at that time felt their frustration so keenly that we don't have access to influence, that they were willing to protest, go on hunger strike, chain themselves to railings, and even one lady famously threw herself under a horse at a horse race, and I don't think intended to be killed, but nonetheless was killed, so that others could have access. And this is exactly what Jesus has done for us thrown himself onto the cross in our place so that we can have access. Because religion in its forms and its outward signs doesn't give us access. Just coming to a church service, frankly, doesn't give us access. Just belonging to a church doesn't give us access. Owning a Bible doesn't give us access. Knowing the creed or something, I mean, those things don't give us Access. It's about Jesus, and you, you, most of us here will know from the series that we're teaching through Hebrews that the whole point of Hebrews is to fix our thoughts on Jesus and to fix our eyes on Jesus so that we don't lose heart as we go through the challenges of this life and we don't shrink back in our faith but continue to live, Hebrews 11, by faith. All those people, by faith. We're going to get to that. Uh, Heinrich is preaching on Hebrews 11 next Sunday. Uh, Hebrews 10 next Friday, Heinrich next Sunday, Hebrews 12 the following Friday, and then Reinhardt is preaching chapter 30 uh, when we're back here next. But that's the point, it's about Jesus. We are so lucky not to have limited access. Keep your finger in Hebrews 9 and turn over to Ephesians 10, uh, 2 with me, please. We're coming back to Hebrews 9 in a moment. But go to Ephesians chapter 2. This is what we have. Chapter 2, and let's pick it up in verse 14. Verse 14. He, uh, Ephesians 2, verse 14. For he himself is our peace. And someone talked about not having peace when we don't have a clear conscience, right? How do we get peace? It's Christ. He himself, verse 14, is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. We have access. We have access to peace. We have access to a clear conscience. We have access to hope because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So there's no limited access, which means that it's available to everybody. And this is the great thing about what Jesus offers, is he offers it not to people from a certain culture, or a certain background, or a certain level of intelligence, or a certain kind of person. He offers it to everybody. It was only Jews who could have access under the Old Covenant. It was only high priests who could go into the tabernacle, and it was only priests, and then it was only a high priest who could go into the most holy of holies to see God, well I didn't really see him, but you know, to be in the presence of God, and that only once a year and with the blood of animals. The access was limited, but we have unlimited access. And it is available to all. It doesn't matter if I can speak just to whoever we are here today. It doesn't matter your background, how bad you feel it is. It doesn't matter how unworthy you feel you are. You might feel unworthy. You might feel it's not for you. You might feel Jesus can't possibly love you. You may feel that you've done too many bad things. You may feel you've drifted too far from God to come back. But that's not true. Yeah. In the access to Jesus is for every single person. From the youngest in this room to the oldest. And from 
the uh, naughtiest to the most saintly. I, I don't know how to put it, but however we view ourselves, all of us have equal access. And if you have drifted from God, if you've drifted and you feel like you've drifted too far, then my appeal to you would be to say, don't trust your own feelings. Trust what Jesus offers you. Of course you can be welcomed back by him. Because he did this for you. So, let's go on back to Hebrews chapter 9 and pick up the story in verse 11. Let's read verse 11. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal salvation, eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially <coughs> unclean sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the Holy Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? Fantastic. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with the out line of, of a tabernacle, but let me just run through that briefly so we get an idea of what he's talking about in these verses. So that's a modern day sort of replica of how people think the tabernacle would have looked in the desert. So you've got your tent of meeting here, and you've got an area around there to prevent people coming in who weren't clean and that kind of thing. And that's a, uh, another angle on the view of what it says. It's not very big. It's not a large thing. The temple, of course, is much bigger, but the tabernacle, not particularly large. Inside, um, you have the area where the uh, general priests could go. And you have the, can, there's the candlesticks, you have the altar of incense and, and so on. You've got the bread here. And that is the curtain beyond which uh, no one can go except the high priest and that once a year. So you've got one curtain to get into the holy place, which is that. And then you've got another curtain to get into the most holy place. And in the most holy place, this is an imagining of what the ark might have looked at like. Perhaps a cherubim and seraphim joining together over might have, looked, might have looked like that. You've got the poles on the side of the altar because you may remember the altar was meant to be carried by the poles. No one was allowed to touch the, uh, sorry, the ark. I'm talking about the ark here. Not allowed to touch the ark, but you could carry it on poles. So that's maybe how the ark looked that sat in the uh, holy of holies, the most holy place. And in the ark were contained the stone tablets, which I don't know if they really look like that, but you know, some kind of stone tablets with the law written and Aaron's staff, which budded. So and a portion of manna was in there as well. So that's the kind of place, that's the kind of setup for what we're talking about there. Now, I don't know how clean you like your kitchen. Um, I must, must admit, I think I'm a typical bloke. I like it to look clean. I'm not really that fussed how clean it is, but as long as it kind of looks reasonably clean. Um, there are some people who like to make sure there's no bacteria within three miles of their house. Um, there's plenty inside us, so I don't know what we can do about that. But anyway, that's another little story. Uh, I don't know if they still have, do they still sell Silit Bang? Yeah. This was, yeah, they do. Okay, so it was a huge advertising campaign when it first came on the market with Silit Bang. You need this to kill all the germs. What was it they said about Domestos? Was it 99% of all known germs dead? I think they couldn't say 100%. I, I, don't, I don't know all the products on the market these days, um, but uh, even, even the best cleansing agent you could possibly buy isn't going to keep, isn't going to get rid of every possible single germ or virus. And even if it did, it wouldn't keep it clean for very long. You'd have to live in a bottle of that stuff to keep yourself permanently clean. And I wouldn't recommend that. Jesus doesn't give us temporary cleanliness. Just when the blood has been sprinkled, like in the Old Covenant. He doesn't, it's not temporary. We don't go in and out of forgiveness. We don't go in and out. We don't have to go in and out of a clear conscience between us and our relationship with God, I mean. We've got better blood. The blood of the, oat, the, goat, the oats, the blood of the goats 
and the bulls and the ashes of a heifer, they were useful to a degree, but we've got the blood of Jesus, the Son of God. We have something far better. I mean, all the sacrifices that were made, I mean, this is just some of them. Look at how many sacrifices they had to make. This is uh, the month of Tisserie, so you've got um, these different days, right? 13 bullocks on day 15, 12 bullocks on day 16, 11 bullocks on day 17, adding up to 71 bullocks for that week. That's a lot of animals. 21 Point three cereal offerings, 15 rams, 105 male rams, 8 male goats. And that's just for one week of, of sacrifices. we got one sacrifice for all time. I'm so glad we live under the new covenant. I mean, for lots of reasons, but, uh, but at least for uh, all the animals that don't have to die. Just, we, just, we just eat them now. That, that's, that's as far as we go. Um, so, whether we value this clear conscience and this cleanliness depends on whether we're aware of how dirty we otherwise would be. I'm going to ask you, let me ask you a question. When's the phys physically the dirtiest you've ever been? If you're willing to share it. Right? Sometime you just, you've been completely, utterly, disgustingly filthy. Yeah? About ten seconds before I was baptized. <laughs> ten seconds before <laughs> you were baptized. <laughs> <laughs> so you were walking around in the sludge and the mud at the bottom yeah. of the Thames? Yes, I can, I've been in there. I guess as soon as I touched the water pretty much when I stepped in, well, suddenly it obviously came. Lots very of cleansed. They're very cleansed at that point. <laughs> Excellent. From d disgusting to uh, beautiful in, uh, in one, one step. Oh, okay. Excellent. Yes, Rudy. Um, I was in a, uh, what would you call it, sort of like a frat house uh, at university. I'm okay. not sure what, it's, uh, what do you call it here. How hall of residence? Yeah, something like that. But they had very, very strict traditions. And one of them was this initiation uh, thing you had to go through. And it was absolutely terrible. You had to first uh, jog with a, with a suitcase of suitable, suitable weight right through the whole town. Eventually you end up with this, uh, it's like a... Um, it's, it's a farm that's part of the university, and in there they have like where the pigs are, and they, they've got a they've got this big hole that is full of pig uh, uh, manure. I mean, yes. it's this the, the utter most awful thing you can imagine. We had to we had to go through that, be submerged through this pig manure, baptized I in mean, pig manure. That was Fantastic. that was bad, and then and then then we had to in our state we had to go do. I had a gym session in the hall. I don't know who cleaned it up afterwards. I can't remember that. But then they poured this stuff, which I don't think any in any uh, Western civilization are allowed to buy this. But it's uh, it's called Dale's track. What is that? Be? But it's like it's like this this small little extract that that stinks to high heaven, and then they pour it over you. Uh, and Love that it. and all sorts of stuff. And I, I literally, it takes you a week to get the smell out of your hair. <laughs> so nothing that I've done ever, you know, before or since, you know, comes close to that. That is absolutely the, the height of reeking. <laughs> let's just make sure that if, if there are any of us who have children of university <laughs> age, we don't send them there. I, think that's just, I don't that's... think it's allowed anymore, to be honest. <laughs> I'm sure it's illegal now. I can't imagine that. I... I imagine all of us have been pretty filthy at one time or another, right? And doesn't it feel great to be clean yeah. after that? When I was, I think, eight years old, I lived in a little village in uh, the Midlands of England called All Brighton. And I had a best friend called Mark. And Mark and I used to get into all kinds of scrapes. Um, and one of the things we did is after school one day, in school uniform, our school was more or less next door to the train station in the village. And bearing in mind that this was back in the mid-1960s, uh, a lot of trains were still steam trains. And so they needed a lot of coal right, for, for fueling them. So this train station, like all train stations, there were huge mounds of coal just out in the open, in a, in a siding kind of area. And I mean, huge. I don't know how tall it was because I was very small, so it seemed like an enormous mountain. But I, I imagine it was at least as high as, as this ceiling here. So my friend and Mark, Mark and I decided after school, rather than going straight home, we'd go and play in the coal heap. It seemed like a good idea. So we ran up and down this coal heap. We sort of burrowed into it. We threw bits of coal around. We rolled up and down it. And um, we, we enjoyed ourselves very much. I remember going home and uh, not really being conscious of how dirty I was. 
I, rang, I knocked on the door, my mum answered the door, and I never forget the look on her face. This was 50 years ago. And I remember the look of absolute shock and horror on her face. She opened up wordless, she didn't say anything. She just looked at me, froze, and then she said, stay there. And then she ran upstairs, and I heard the bath being run. And she came down a minute later, and then she picked me up. Bear in mind, she's actually very badly arthritic, and it must have been very painful for her. She picked me up, and carried me up the stairs, and put me in the bath, clothes on, and everything. Wow. And this grey and black scum just came up onto the water, and it took her a long time to get me uh, clean. And um, I've never been allowed to forget that. So, um, I just... There's something about knowing how clean you are because of knowing how dirty you were. And this is one of the powerful things about what motivates us in our Christian lives. is being so grateful that we have been made so clean because we were so dirty. I don't think it's good as a Christian to think back on your sins all the time, like obsessing about them. But I think it is healthy now and again to think back to what life was like before you knew God and where you would be potentially at least, if God hadn't encountered you at that point in your life and cleaned you up with the blood of Jesus, his son. Let's, let's talk about forgiveness by going on a bit further to verse 15. <clears throat> For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when someone has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of the calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Forgiveness. You know, forgiveness and being forgiven is a word we use in church and in our conversations with one another, sometimes almost glibly, because we accept it, and we should accept it, but perhaps we take it for granted. Nothing is cleansed without blood, the blood of Jesus. And because we have that, then there is forgiveness. Without it, there is none of um, Oh, oh, I didn't, forgot to show you that. That's my mum. There she is, and she's so angelic. <laughs> That's the person who picked me up and put me in the bath. Well done, mum. Thank you. Okay. Forgiveness. Okay. Do you have stubborn problems with your oven? Okay. I, I like the, the name of this, uh, this website, the Oven Cleaning. The Stubborn Oven Cleaning Company. When you get those, you get your, I mean, I don't know about you, but probably the least favourite job in the whole house is cleaning the oven. Even, I must admit, you know, they, they sell you these supposedly self-cleaning ovens these days. Uh, they, they have, I've never actually seen that work. Um, maybe you get someone in to do it. That's the way I think. Um, we, our, our sin is stubborn. It will stick unless Jesus deals with it. Because just trying to be better won't do it. See, how do we deal with a clear, trying to get a clear conscience and, and, and clean up our conscience? I think a lot of the time the way we deal with it is, okay, I'm going to behave better now. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to stop that. I'm going to stop that sin. I'm going to stop that way of thinking. I'm, I'm going to behave, I'm going to serve more. I, I'm going to be more connected to people. I'm going to love people more. I, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to give more. I'm going to help the poor more. I'm going to... And we, get, we can get into this thing where we're trying to deal with our own issues without letting Jesus in. And really coming to him humanly and fully and from the heart and saying, I really need you. I really need you, God. I, I do think that, the, that David understood this. 
Even though he was an old covenant person, King David seemed to understand that he really needed God because nothing around him and nothing in himself was working. This is why the Psalms are so helpful for us. And we have Jesus as a mediator. We have Jesus as the one who goes to God on our behalf and pleads our case because of his sacrifice and his blood. What a radical level of redemption that is. We have been slaves to sin. We are set free by what Jesus does for us. I don't know if you saw the news stories um, in the last few days about the slave market in Libya. And it's a shocking thing, you know, given... given given the history of slavery and everything to do with that, that there is still modern day slavery. And we know it exists, but it's sort of hidden. And uh, one of the stories that came to light recently was of migrants who, who are, who've had to flee fighting in Sudan and Syria and other places. And in, in fleeing for their lives, they found themselves in Libya, as a, what they hoped was a staging post to get to uh, Europe, the continent. And yet they got stuck there. And many of them are being sold into slavery. Uh, the price of a young man. Where's the price? Here we are. Um, the price of a young man is about 300 pounds. Can you imagine? That's what you're worth. And someone pays 300 pounds and you are their slave. To do whatever they wish. And I'm glad it's coming to light. And uh, you know, I know there are agencies who are trying to make a difference. And I think it's, by the way, this is one of those things that should be on our prayer list. Our uh, prayer list should involve things that are on our own hearts, our own lives, but it should also involve governmental issues, praying for kings and those in authority, Paul says to Timothy, um, and praying about issues, world issues, and agencies that can make a difference. And so maybe you and I can't make a direct difference, but honestly, surely our prayers can make a difference. So let's be sure we're praying about that. I can only imagine if I was one of the young people being sold and I was sold into slavery and then someone came and redeemed me. I mean, that person who redeemed me, they would be my friend for life, forever. I would do anything for that person. And this is the motivation for us in serving God. It's not to gain something, it's out of gratitude for what we have been given. When was the last time you took a, maybe I had a quiet time, a prayer time, just to think about what you've been given by God. Write down a few of the things that God has given you. And I think we'll find that that will thoroughly encourage us. So, just to wrap up, let's finish off the chapter. Uh, picking it up again in verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ has sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who who are waiting for him. So, Jesus is the better sacrifice. Jesus is in God's presence and is giving us access into God's presence. Jesus did this once for all so that we can enjoy its benefits all through this life and in the fullness of the next life. And he will appear again to take us to be hung with him because he has bought us with his own blood. How lucky we are. How do we have a clear conscience? I think it comes down to this. I think it comes down to this. We need to trust that Jesus has done enough, even though you haven't. And that's true of us becoming Christians. I think if it's true of us living the Christian life, 
you still can't do enough. I mean, enough in the way that sometimes our conscience troubles us. Have I done enough? The call is not to do enough. The call is to, to give your heart. Serve the best you can. Do the best you can. And don't get caught up in these mind games of whether I've actually done enough. You can't do enough. Do your best. Give your heart. And then you must trust Jesus that he has already done what is enough in God's sight. For you to be fully having access to God. To be fully loved by God. To be no barriers between you and God. Never. Not one day. Not one hour of our lives. Never does there need to be a barrier. Because Jesus has done enough even though we haven't. To Jesus be all the glory. Amen. Amen.